Gail Kasla, Heyman Deligami, Bruce Curtis, Uguan Matla Community Justice Center. Welcome. My name is Bruce Curtis and the Chief Administrator of the Community Justice Center. Olagala, Iquanala. You're looking very good tonight. On behalf of the Community Justice Center and our partners in the Campanola Lectures 10th anniversary season, uh, the Comox First Nation, North Island College, Comox Valley Schools, the Sid Williams Theatre, and the Comox Valley Arts Gallery, and this evening's gold level sponsors, RLR Law Group, and our bronze level sponsor, the Comox Valley Unitarian Fellowship. I thank you for coming. I would like to invite Councillor Charlene Everson of the Comox First Nation to extend the official welcome to the traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. Kila Kessla, Nuko Am Hanusamega, Gaetanlach Komox, Plutaches. My name is Charlene Everson. My traditional name is. Um, I was like, what is my traditional name? No. <laughs> Obviously, a little bit nervous. Um, my traditional name means uh, she who stands naked, which is uh, translated as um, somebody who will give the clothes off their back. Um, I just like to welcome everybody here today on behalf of Comox First Nation, Gila Kessla. Um, and I'd like to especially welcome our, our special guest here. And um, I, I, I'm going to keep this pretty brief, but I, uh, one thing I'd like to say, I was rem remembering that my, my mom reminded me of uh, in the potlatch, uh, when the chiefs are speaking, one of the things that they would say is that uh, when a chief would speak and another chief would come up and he would say, they would say, oh, your, your words taste really good. And uh, I feel like... Um, we're going to experience a little bit of that tonight, so thank you for being here, and um, Gaila Kessla, everyone, uh, welcome to the traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. Gaila Kessla. And I welcome Dr. Lisa DeMay, President of North Island College, for her greetings. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, good evening. I'm Lisa Dome. I'm the new president of North Island College, and I'm delighted to bring greetings from NIC. On behalf of our college, we have many students joining us tonight, as well as I'd like to recognize uh, the chair of our Board of Governors, Eric Mosley, and the vice chair, Jane Atherton, who have also joined us today. Active community partnerships, like the one we have with the Community Justice Center, demonstrate how NIC works together to build healthy and thriving communities, how we engage students in real world experience through their education, and how we support communities moving forward. So we are delighted to have this opportunity to, to continue to partner with the Community Justice Center and are honored to have the opportunity uh, to introduce the 10th annual Iona Campanolo speaker. Thank you so very much. And now I welcome Michelle Waite, Vice Chair of School District 71, one of our other partners. Mask off, glasses on. Hello. On behalf of the Comox Valley Board of Education and our school district community, I bring warm greetings to you this evening. In attendance with me tonight is Trustee Sarah Jane Howe and many others from our district team. It takes a community to raise and educate our children. And thank you to each of you. The Comox Valley School District is proud to be a partner with the Community Justice Center. The CJC provides services which include supports and education to the youth in our community who may be our students, neighbors, are part of our family. Let's listen and learn together tonight so we can continue to create change for tomorrow and beyond. Thank you.
At the outset, CJC's patron, the Honourable Iona Campanola, has asked me to extend her deep regret that she is not able to join us this year to introduce our speaker. She's been advised that as she approaches her 89th birthday on Monday, she ought, <laughs> she ought to keep herself out of public settings as they, so as to reduce the risk of any exposure to COVID. I know that she has very much enjoyed the previous nine Campanola lectures and that she's eagerly anticipating watching this one from her home, in safety, free from COVID, and happy. Uh, she, but she was especially looking forward to this year's celebrated lecturer and the breadth of events called together for this year's edition. In this evening's lecture entitled Supernatural Restorative Justice, Getath Atzlie, Terry Lynn Williams Davidson, will be drawing out the connections between environmental protection, cultural and linguistic preservation and recovery, and what it truly means to work towards making things right. She is not the only advocate operating from this worldview, but she is among the very limited few who integrates her work over legal advocacy, writing, visual art, music, and community engagement around reconciliation. As I prepared these remarks, I was reminded of a novel by, James, by Janie Chang called The Library of Legends. In it, she tells the story of the evacuation of the coastal universities during the Sino-Japanese War in 1937. As the students, faculty, and staff prepared to flee their human campus, their home campus, uh, they took the time to gather the valuable library of ancient Chinese texts and legends and myths and carried them across a thousand miles to the safety of rural China, where they locked them in caves to protect them for the, for the time to come. Their sole purpose was to protect the knowledge that they held and preserve it for the next generation. As she wrote, maybe it's because legends are truer to our natures than serious literature. Maybe myths and legends might reveal more about us than poetry or epic histories. Myths are the darkest and brightest incarnations of who we are. They slip into our dreams and underpin our reality. As Thomas King has written, land contains the languages, the stories, and the histories of the people. It provides water, air, shelter, and food. Land participates in the ceremonies and songs, and land is home. It is these strongly held beliefs that motivate the integrative work of Gatha Atlie, and of all those striving to preserve ancient culture, ancient language, and ancient stories, because that's what drives us to preserve the lands and upon which we live. There are two views that have resulted from the arrival of settlers in North America. One viewed the land and all the beings and the non-human non beings as part of the community in which the land dwelt. And the second view was that the land was a resource to extract, to exploit, to sell for profit. This evening's presentation begins our exploration of the former view with the context of the gifts of the supernatural spirits, ancestors, and elders of Haida Gwaii. So please welcome Rachel Blaney, MP for North Island Powell River, who will introduce our speaker for the 10th annual Campanola Lecture on Restorative Justice. It's always interesting, these extra steps that we've added in our lives because of COVID and the patience that we take with one another as we make space for that. So first of all, I just want to thank you all so much for being here and also acknowledge that we are on the Comox unceded territory and thank them so much for allowing us to do all the things that we do in their community and in their territory. And I also just want to take a moment to recognize what an honor it is for me to stand here in Honorable Iono Capilano's shoes and just thank her for her steadfast, strong voice in this region. 
These annual lectures were gifted to the CGC patron, the Honourable Iona Capilono, on the occasion of her 80th birthday and 10 years on, look at what this legacy has become. The lecturer for this 10th anniversary of these lectures in restorative justice is Terry Lynn Williams Davidson. Get off at Slie, Oates Slie. Born and raised in Haida Gwaii, Williams Davidson was given the name Lakwagons, Haida for beautiful sound in her maternal, by her maternal great grandmother, Susan Williams. She was also gifted her other name from her grandmother, great grandmother. She is a member of the Raven clan of the Haida peoples and is married to Robert Davidson of the Eagle clan, stepmother to Professor Sarah Davidson and the late Haida artist, Ben Davidson. She began singing in Haida at 13 and soon after co-founded a children's dance group, Skidigit Haida Dancers in 1978. No introduction to her can find an easy starting point. Is she a knowledge keeper, lawyer, musician, artist, author? Or an artist, lawyer, knowledge keeper, author, musician? Or a musician, artist, author, lawyer, knowledge keeper? She is all of these. And it all comes together in her work across the traditional disciplinary lines, each one informing the other. She blends the inspirations behind the art pieces, the ancient oral traditions of Haida Gwaii and their relationship to Haida laws and values and their contemporary significance today. Getath Otlie is a highly accomplished individual with talents which cross and blur the lines the usual lines of many fields, yet she towers in each. And more importantly, her practice in each field is the manifestation of a unified view rooted in her heritage as a proud Haida woman. That view expresses the values of language and cultural recovery, the ancient connection to the land, the spiritual connection between the land, sea, and air, and their interconnection of all peoples to all of that. As she has written, my practice of law, music, art, and writing are all grounded in a desire to contribute to our understanding of humanity's relationship with the land and sea. All four disciplines have become an exploration of Haida laws expressed through the supernatural beings and the crest figures portrayed in this exhib exhibition. She holds multiple academic degrees, a BSc in economics and computer science, an LLB in environmental and indigenous laws, and an LLM. She is not only highly educated, but she is also deeply educated. She is embedded in Haida culture, practice singing, dancing, and storytelling to bring the ancestors and spiritual beings together in the joint venture of repairing the harms caused by colonialism. Her career also includes the release of three music albums which have garnered many awards and much recognition, including several Canadian Aboriginal Music Awards and nominations for Western Canadian Music Awards, Aboriginal People's Choice Awards, Canadian Folk Music Awards, and Native American Music Awards. She sees her music as building a bridge between two cultures, law and the arts, which serves to connect to the current need in Canadian society to reach reconciliation with Indigenous nations. The idea to integrate the ancient oral traditions of Haida Gwaii with contemporary music, the results of which she calls cutting edge ancient, came to Williams Davidson early on in her musical career. On Saturday evening here at the SID, she and her band, including two of the founders of the band Chilliwack, will be performing songs wrote, she wrote to accompany, to accompany the images of her solo exhibition. The solo show opened at the beginning of the month and the formal opening and artist talk are this Friday online. The show continues through until December 31st. Her legal work has included challenging to the the challenge to the tree farm license number 35 case. She won the landmark case in Indigenous and Environmental Law in 2004 where the Supreme Court affirmed the Crown duty and by extension the duty of private corporations to consult and accommodate Indigenous rights and title even before they are fully articulated and proven in treaty. 
Her former law professor and mentor, Michael Jackson, has pointed out that in the TFL case, she provided the basis for the Supreme Court to come to understand a different legal regime, Haida law, and how it can connect to Canadian law. As a counter to the common understanding and belief of governments and forest companies, which saw the forest as a commodity to be extracted and sold, Get Oth Otslier expressed the worldview of the Haida that the cedar is a sister, which shapes Haida practice in her relationship to the forest. The Haida perspective on the forest, proper land, use management principles, and rights at stake embodies the Haida worldview, which acknowledges the living spirit or power of all beings, both animate and inanimate, and respects these beings for giving their life to sustain us. Through this view expressed in the Supreme Court's understanding and ruling, we can all come to see and understand that supernatural beings blanket the entire landscape, waters, and ocean. And this deep connection to the spiritual reality of the Haida culture is also expressed and connected in her work with visual arts. Her exhibition at the Bill Reed Gallery in Vancouver, Out of Conceal Concealment, Female Supernatural Beings of Haida Gwaii, was a powerful exploration through photo collage of these beings. That exhibition has been supplemented with the additional pieces and is currently at the Comox Valley Art Gallery as part of this 10th anniversary celebration. So I invite you all to give a very warm and strong welcome to the 10th annual Capanolo Lecture to the amazing Terry Lynn Williams Davidson. Thank you very much for that very, very kind introduction. I feel that after that introduction, maybe my job is done and I don't need to lecture tonight. <laughs> I would like to begin by acknowledging the unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. It is such, such, so important to me to have that welcome for our words, our welcome in this territory and joining with the spirits of the territory. I would like to thank the Community Justice Center for uh, the vision to not only invite me to this lecture, but also the exhibit and the concert uh, on Saturday. It's an incredible vision. Thank you very much, Bruce. And of course, I acknowledge Iona Campanolo. She has been a giant in that she provided great inspiration to me as a young person in a remote community, so much so that I'll remove my mask. She was acknowledged by the Haida people for what she does with the gifting of a name, Sa Nang Awas, or sitting high. And I'll talk a little bit about what that name means later on. I thought I would begin tonight with an image illustrating Jilla Kun's. She is the ancestress of all the Haida people who are eagles. And I've depicted her in a very famous narrative from the narratives of the Haida nation where five men go fishing. And one of them belonged to the Raven clan. In the Haida nation, you are either an e eagle or a raven. And in those clans, you wear only those crests that belong to your clan. One of the raven men had on a hat that had a cormorant, which is an eagle crest. And I have to pause here and say that it's so interesting that, that the uh, Comox First Nation welcome came with a heron feather, which is the same word in our language. In any event, he had a cormorant on his hat, which he was not entitled to wear. And because he wasn't entitled to wear it, the hat kept falling off and he wasn't able to catch fish. And he cursed Jilla Kunz, the ancestress of the eagles, for causing him to not, not catch fish. They went back to their camp and started eating their catch. 
And to their amazement, a beautiful copper frog came over to them. And one of the men who is what we call Gugos, or someone without ears, I'm sure some of you know people like the hut, <laughs> who don't listen and keep doing something that they shouldn't. He grabbed that copper frog and he put it in the fire. And the frog sat in the fire and burst. And they, and yet the copper frog still remained in the fire. And so they stoked the fire again and watched the frog in the fire and it burst once again. And so they went to bed. And the next morning, as they were approaching their town, they saw a transparent being on the shore. And the being told them a prophecy and said that they would not reach home, that every one of them, one of them would die at each point on their way home and only the steersmen would survive. Sure enough, one of them died at each point as they made their way home back to the town of Kampshua in southern Haida Gwaii. And he lived to tell the story. <clears throat> the next day, the children were playing on the beach and they saw a very strange woman approach them. And she had skin that was the color of soot and she had a large belly and they were so curious about her. Rather than respecting her, they went running over to her and struck her belly and it made a noise like a drum and they laughed. And then she told them that she was, that their town would not, sur not survive and that fire was coming to them. They didn't listen and they went back to playing. And then came an onset of a volcano. Soot started falling from the sky. The ocean started burning. Pieces of fire came down from the sky and the town perished. Before they perished, a woman came out of the ocean, and it was this Jilla Kunz. And she is carrying the cane of a supernatural being, which is both blue and red. And she wears a frog on her hat. And she came to warn them once again that they still could change their ways if they followed the laws of respect. They did not, and the whole town perished. Now I start with this story to set the table for the supernatural beings of Haida Gwaii that I will share with you tonight. These supernatural beings are grounded in a long, long occupation of Haida Gwaii, just like indigenous peoples have long occupied their territories and the Comox people have long occupied this area. We've witnessed the changing of Haida Gwaii incredible changes to Haida Gwaii from glaciation to glaciations, floods, and even the onset of vegetation and the arrival of plants, the most important of which to the Haida people and to people on the coast was the arrival of the cedar tree. That cedar tree allowed the creation of incredible cultures of abundance that came from the ancient sister that we heard about earlier this evening. Our ancient sister allowed us to build a culture with, of abundance with masks and ceremonies and totem poles. Our homes were from the cedar tree and our canoes were from the cedar tree. Those canoes allowed us to connect with our surrounding nations and it was truly cultures of abundance. We view the world around us as being Beings in, as beings in and of themselves. This is an image that my husband created, Robert Davidson. It is Southeast Wind. When Southeast Wind appears in our realm, they appear as a kilowell. And artists like Robert Davidson and many before him have depicted Southeast Wind as a kilowell. The Haida word for supernatural is the same word for kilowell. It has the same root, root word. The word for supernatural is skanagwa or skanagwai, and the word for kilowell is skana. So they're intimately connected, and I'll tell you more about that and show you that in this image. This is a new image that I've created with my team, and it illustrates 
the four realms in the Haida conception of the world. Above is the sky realm, the beautiful shining heavens, the upper world. The ocean realm, which sits below Haida Gwaii in North America. The third realm in the Haida worldview are the islands of Haida Gwaii. We call those islands inland country or Haida land. And then the mainland of North America that we call the seaward country. This illustrates all those realms, but it also illustrates an important supernatural being whose name is Kuya Gagandals. And much like the, the Greek narrative of the fight to who would hold up the world and Atlas lost, our narrative is different in that Kuya Gagandals won the battle. He won the right and the responsibility to hold up Haida Gwaii. And so on his chest is a cedar pole that goes from his chest. And on top of that pole is Haida Gwaii, and it balances precariously. And every time there is about to be an earthquake, an ermine runs up the pole and down and causes the land to shake. In the photo, it shows the undersea world of the ocean peoples. In our worldview, these ocean peoples live in homes much like ours. In the narratives, when we've journeyed down into their realm, we see them as people, just as you appear today. They live in homes, they have totem poles, and live the same lives as ours. When they come into our realm, they appear as kilowells, and so in the upper corner are kilowells breaching the surface of the ocean realm. When they come into our realm, the human realm, they appear as kilowells. This image is really important because it illustrates one of the key laws of the Haida Nation and indeed many indigenous peoples, which is the law of balance, get kill juice in the Haida language. Surely we need to find balance in our relationship with the environment and that is much of, of what I speak about in the exhibit. Another incredible law that comes from, from this narrative is the law of responsibility. And that word in the Haida language is lagu ga And interestingly, it means you on it, chest leaning on. So we feel responsibilities in our chest, much as the same way as Kuya Gagandals is feeling the responsibility of holding up our existence and holding up Haida Gwaii. So our world is not, our worldview is not one of obligations, we have to do this or we're commanded to do that, but rather it's one of responsibilities and willingness to do something to keep things in balance and keep things proper. This next image illustrates the view that we heard about earlier in Bruce's remarks about all the beings in our world being a people in and of themselves. Salmon, we call the salmon, salmon people. When the salmon come into our realm, they put on salmon cloaks, so they appear as salmon in our world. And we have uh, laws that we exchange between the salmon people and us about how much salmon may be taken we pay reciprocity and gifts to the salmon so that we might live and that we may take their lives. Many of the oral narratives talk about work going back and forth between these realms, going into the world of the salmon people, going into the realm of the ocean people. So those journeys become portals for greater understanding, to learn knowledge through offerings, making offerings to the salmon people, uh, giving, saying prayers to them through dance, through song, through ceremony, through dreams, and through art, and through gifts given in the fire, the portal to the supernatural beings. Many of those interactions are documented in crests. So I spoke about the cormorant being a crest of the Eagle Clan. This is a dance that Rainbow Creek is doing of the shark dance. And it is a crest of Robert's father's clan, the Yakut Lanas Yaku Janes. 
and they obtained this crest through rescuing a shark that was caught in the low tide area and in exchange they were given the rights and responsibilities to keep this dance alive. So all of our crests are like that. They document interactions that we've had with the supernatural beings and with the beings around us. Now I want to turn to the Haida world word for law. It is kil yata. And it has the same root word as the law of respect, yakudang. That is another fundamental law of the Haida Nation and many indigenous peoples. The first word is kil, and it means voice or words or language. And you might wonder, how are laws tied to voice? How are they tied to language? And to know that, to, to fully understand that, you have to look to potlatch because it is in potlatches and feasts and ceremonies that we give voice to law. Those who potlatch and those who feast and give back to the community in that way become yaqeit in the Haida language. They become someone worthy of respect. They don't get, they don't gain rank by being wealthy. They gain rank by sharing that wealth through the community. So the Haida language, the word in the Haida language for law incorporates ideas of right, of truthful, of appropriate, and respectful. There is a phrase, Iwang Laga Yakudang, and it means that someone found his or her own path. Because marriages were viewed as strategic alliances for a couple to come together to potlatch and to feast and to give back to the community. And at that, this moment, I'd like to pause and say that I truly found my own path when I married Robert Davidson, and I'd like to thank him for being here tonight. And also my sisters, Linda and Sharon, who all, all of them are such great support to me. And Thank you very much. It is through that support that we are able to give back to the community and share knowledge and, sh and share ceremonies. In, this is a potlatch that we hosted and it depicts frogs coming out. These are masks that Ben Davidson, my stepson, carved. Uh, it is an incredible dance that intrigues and captures the attention of children shown here. Um, it was a wonderful potlatch in that Calvin Hunt and his family came and attended the potlatch and shared ceremonies as well. At this potlatch, Robert gifted dance screens to all of the clans in Haida Gwaii so that they would have a backdrop for their feasts and potlatches. This is another supernatural being. Her name is Low Tide Woman, and she is the caretaker of the low tide area. So she allows the tide to rise and fall, and when it falls, people can harvest from that area if they pay respect to her. So she teaches that the law of respect, that respect must be paid before we can take of other beings in the oceans, from the oceans, and that we must give back before we can take that life. Another being that we believe and is found in every creek woman, at every creek in, in Haida Gwaii is creek woman, or daughters of the river, and they take care of the salmon and the trout that return to the rivers. So much like low tide woman, she's the gatekeeper, she ensures that the, that the salmon return, that we don't take too much. The bear, the tan, understands that relationship. He comes and leaves the salmon at the edges of the creeks, and that nitrogen from the salmon builds these beautiful forests. And so it is a whole ecosystem of relationships between people, between creek women, between the salmon and the people and the bears in the forest. I don't think we have seen 
I know that we have not yet seen these laws and this way of viewing the world in Canadian law. Rather, we have witnessed terra nullius, this idea that characterize these lands that we are on right now and in Canada as empty land at law. It was therefore free for the taking, free to extract resources from. Colonization was an effort to physically remove us from the land and sea through confining us to reserves and through transforming the legal landscape to one that replaced Indigenous laws so that that taking could occur. And it went further. It removed children from culture through residential institutions that have been so painfully, we've become so painfully aware of this past year. And that idea of terra nullius and the colonization effort discouraged the practice of culture and even the expression of Indigenous laws. I've included an image here that, of a sculpture that Charles Edenshaw made. And this was made at another time, far beyond our lifetimes at the start of colonization. It was a challenging time then of momentous change when previous generations were facing the full effects of things like the potlatch ban of discouraging culture and language. And yet, People, artists like Charles Edenshaw, continued to depict our oral narratives in art without, under the noses of Indian agents and missionaries. These elders at the time and those artists witnessed our lands being taken away. They witnessed the suppression of the language. They literally saw art and culture leaving homes to go to museums around the world. So it is incredible that he continued and had the foresight to preserve some of those oral narratives in his art. We recognize today that great strides have been made and have started to be made to correcting the wrongs with this idea of terra nullius and the doctrine of discovery, of discovering these lands. But that denial still remains with us today. As much progress as we've made, it still remains us, with us today. The corresponding equivalent for the oceans is marinellius, or empty seas at law. They cleared the way for exploitation as well. Herring were especially hard hit in the 1950s through to the 1970s. For example, in 1956, a record-breaking 78,000 tons of herring were taken from Burnaby Island alone. That is more than any single area in British Columbia, and it is the equivalent weight of 45,500 SUVs. And that was just one catch, and that catch continued and continued for another decade. Oceans are so important to our existence. They cover over 70% of the globe. Yet, over 90% of the world's marine stocks are fully exploited, are overexploited, or depleted, like the abalone and the herring. Despite these hard statistics, I do believe in hope, and I share that hope with Robert. This is another of his images called Skuk Stung, Two Dog Salmon. It's an image he created in 2018, and I'd like to read his statement that this image is about hope that we change direction from global an annihilation to a more balanced way of life. These two dog salmon are in the last stage of their life as they swim upstream to lay their eggs, ensuring another generation of dog salmon. It has become more and more present-day civilization's responsibility to ensure they will return again and again for future generations. Robert has inspired my art practice greatly. This is another image that he created, and he called it Occupied. Our bedtime talk is about Aboriginal law <laughs> and cases, and so we talked about this idea that we have to prove 
Aboriginal title to the entire landscape, every square inch, before we su can succeed in litigation. And so this is his representation of that, this requirement to prove title to every square inch and his design completely fills the entire space. It is an interesting exploration of Northwest Coast art that we're also familiar with in that it has, Northwest Coast art has a form line, but here he's playing with your mind in that it doesn't have a form line. And I thought that was similar to crown title in that there is no basis for crown title in Canada without first addressing Aboriginal title. And so I in included that idea in Octopus Woman. And it explores Indigenous laws and their place in Canada. We are starting to learn now what Indigenous laws are. They're not Aboriginal law. Aboriginal law is Canadian law trying to understand Indigenous laws. They are the laws that end up in, in the common law but they're not Indigenous laws. Indigenous laws are, as Bruce spoke about, the laws that are written in the land and sea. They're contained in oral histories, they're contained in our songs, they're contained in our dances and in our art. And they're right in front of us, but we may not see it until your mind is, gets accustomed to seeing it. And so ghosted in the background of this image is Robert's Occupied. And once you see it, you can't unsee it in the same way of someone working with Indigenous laws that once they recognize an Indigenous law, it is no longer something hidden from view. Octopus Woman is like what Robert said about dog salmon in that she is all about the next generations. When an octopus develops eggs and gives birth to them, that is the beginning of the end for her. She starts decomposing, her skin starts falling off, but she lives to keep her eggs alive and she constantly and obsessively tends to her eggs to make sure that they have enough oxygen to survive. And she has an important message for us because often our use of the environment, our laws around protecting the environment and using the resources, don't look to the future and don't ensure that there will be enough for future generations. I've chosen to depict octopus women in a ruby and a dark red dress. Her limbs are red. For those of you who have gone out to harvest octopus, you know that they change color when they, became ang when they become angry, when they uh, when they have to defend themselves, they get aggressive and they change color and become red. Because despite the challenges of proving title, Indigenous peoples have been prepared to do it and are doing it in so many cases in Canadian law. As soon as the laws were changed so that we could hire lawyers to bring our cases forward, we did, and slowly the law is evolving to recognize that Indigenous people's title pre-exists Crown title and our rights pre-exist Canadi other Canadian rights. Of course, the challenge is how do the two live together? One of the great challenges is recognizing how, is how to evaluate damages to land and damages to culture. And in 2017, there was a case from the Supreme Court of Canada that the Tanaha Nation had brought forward. They had worked for 20 years to protect a place of spiritual importance to them. It is the home of the grizzly bear and the spirit of the grizzly bear. And it was slated to become a ski resort development. The Supreme Court of Canada held that Section 2A of the Charter, which is the, the provision that protects religion, that that section only protects the freedom to practice religion, and I would say culture, but not the focal point of the religion or the culture. In other words, this site could not be protected, although the Tanaha were free to exercise their culture and their religion. The Supreme Court of Canada said that to hold otherwise, they would have to get into deciding what is religion and, and making comments on what the merits of religious belief are 
and that they would breach their neutrality and would be in, interfering with religious matters. And so they did not rule in favor of the Tanaha. So courts in this case and others are really incapable of recognizing that development causes not just religious harm, but cultural harm and losses. And then it's even hard to evaluate and put a dollar figure on what those losses might be, because those are typically the remedies available from Canadian courts. Is there an alternative to litigation? There is, and it is like the work here with the Community Justice Foundation, Community Justice Center, excuse me. It is community working together. So after this litigation, the Tanaha and the community came together with foundations and protected the area without, despite the Supreme Court of Canada's decision, they were able to protect the spirit of the grizzly bear. There are other moral imperatives to change for all of us. I have to mention, of course, that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action from 2015. None are in relation to the environment, but they call upon all levels of government to fully implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and to develop an action plan to fully implement UNDRIP. They also called upon the establishment of Indigenous Laws Institutes for the understanding of Indigenous laws. Of course, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 29.1, provi provides for the right to conservation and protection of the environment for Indigenous peoples' lands and territories. Article 32.1, provides that Indigenous peoples have the right to determine the development or use of their lands and territories and other resources. In Article 32.2, that states shall obtain Indigenous peoples free and prior informed consent, what we call FPIC, before they approve projects that affect their interests, like the ski resort in the Tanaha Territory. And 32.3, that states shall provide some mechanism or way to ensure that there is just and fair redress when there is damage to land and, and territories. Locally here in British Columbia is BC's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The action plan that was recently re released holds promise that the that DRIPA, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, will be implemented. But so far, it is silent about how Indigenous laws will be implemented. And it's silent about how new measures might be implemented to deal with the free, prior, and informed consent. Now, I want to return to another narrative that we call the Copper Salmon Narrative. And in this narrative, uh, a chief's son lost all of his father's wealth in gambling. He lost it completely. And his father didn't punish him. He didn't chastise him. He didn't banish him. He didn't put him in prison. Instead, he told him, eat medicine, my child. And so the son went to the top of a mountain for a spirit quest. And on his way, he cut Devil's Club it's a, that's a member of the ginseng family. And he got to the top of the mountain and he built his cedar shelter. He found a special plant that is known to bring wealth and he ate it and he ate the devil's club. And after he had gone through that cleansing and gained the support of the medicine, in the still of the forest he heard a salmon in the nearby creek. So he went to the creek, he crawled to the creek in the dark, and he caught the salmon, and it was made of copper. So he carried that copper salmon and he put it in the cedar shelter overnight. And as he held the copper salmon, he learned a song from the supernatural beings that told him about that copper salmon. The next morning, he made his journey down back to his family but before he did so, and on the way, he, he turned that copper salmon into coppers, like this one shown here in the forest. 
He gave them names that the supernatural beings had told him about when he was on his spirit quest, and he brought them back to his father. So when he returned back to his village, they, he gave the copper shields to his father, and he gave them the song. Songs are incredible objects of wealth in Haida culture and many indigenous people's culture, cultures. They have more wealth than actual objects themselves. And in, this, in his journey, he learned about his responsibility to his father. It was not to gamble away his wealth, but it was to contribute to the wealth of his father. He learned about reciprocity by, play, by paying respect to the salmon, by carefully carrying it into the cedar shelter overnight and on the moss floor. And he learned how to strengthen the social and cultural fabric of his village with the songs and the coppers that were shared in future potlatches. The Haida word for the closest approximation that we have to the words reconciliation that, that we hear so much about is kilyata. And I interpret this to mean to make better because it is impossible to make things completely right given our shared history in Canada and given the damage to places in our territories and to the salmon people and the herring people. So one way to make things better is to not just to recognize Aboriginal title, but to recognize and implement Indigenous laws, to create space for Indigenous peoples to implement our laws. As I mentioned, Indigenous laws are our original laws. They are found in the art and the stories and the songs and the narratives. They're not the same as restorative justice, although restorative justice can draw upon Indigenous laws. And they can certainly be laws that we can draw upon to restore the environment to, um, from the ravages of colonization. One of those laws is a law that my paternal grandfather, Chief Skidigat, shared with the Haida people in 1969. And I'm going to read what he said. People are like trees, and groups of people are like forests. While the trees are composed of many different kinds of trees, these trees intertwine their roots so strongly that it is impossible for the strongest winds which blow on our islands to uproot our forest. For each tree strengthens its neighbor and their roots are inextricably intertwined. In the same way, the people of our islands, composed of members of nations and races from all over the world, are beginning to intertwine their roots so strongly that no troubles will affect them. Just as one tree standing alone will soon be destroyed by the first strong wind which came came along, so it is impossible for any family or any community to stand against the troubles of this world. So we learn from Chief Skidigat that everyone and everything is interconnected. He teaches us the law of interconnectedness, that everything depends upon everything else. He teaches us that what you do to one person affects all people, that what you do to the land affects the sea, and what you do to the sea affects the land, and that what each of us does every day affects the entire earth. As a plug for <laughs> the Sea Bag exhibit, this little booklet is, is in the exhibit, the new piece in the exhibit, and the booklet is also available there as well. So this idea of working together is found in our art. As I mentioned, there are many things that, many of the laws are found in the art. This is an image of a Nahin blanket, a Chilkat blanket, and it's an incredible um, style of weaving. It's the only weaving in the world that you can create a circle. 
and there are many design elements that echo Northwest Coast form line art. And on, in the next slide, this is an image of my weaving teacher, Cheryl Samuel, showing the front and the back side of the, the borders, the yellow and black borders of the blanket. And it is called an interlocking join in that each border comes into each other and they're woven together. But yet when you look at the front of the robe, they look like they are separate borders. They look like they might be separate jurisdictions, Canada and BC and Indigenous peoples jurisdictions. But yet our goal is to find a way for those jurisdictions and those laws to interlock with each other so that they might be strengthened. I believe that we can sort through the interlinked strands of displaced culture and colonization and that we can be stronger like these Chilkat robes. These Chilkat robes have warp of wool and cedar bark. The cedar bark gives it structural strength and it endures. So these robes are found in museums around the world and found in indigenous communities because of the strength of the cedar woven into the warp. Now I want to return to the story of Jilakuns, the ancestress of the Haida people who are eagles. In the story, there were beings who gave warnings to the people time and time again, asked them if they really wanted to continue doing what they're doing, much like the comedian last night who checked, is this really your choice? <laughs> But yet, yet the people continued. And the people accepted the inevitability of the outcome. They realized that they had breached fundamental laws and that they had to face the consequences of breaching those laws. In the story of Jilla Kunz and other oral narratives, we learn a number of things. Many of the oral narratives have stories of individuals being banished for, for breaching laws or of entire communities abandoning an individual with his grandmother. And that space gives them space for critical self-reflection during that exile. It often led to those individuals who were banished or left behind to transform themselves through the power of cedar, through building beautiful homes, through accumulating uh, incredible wealth. The supernatural beings tested those individuals and would gift them a small tail of a salmon. And if they didn't, if they carried themselves well and they didn't become proud and they didn't get flagrant with that wealth, then the supernatural beings gave a little bit more. They gave them the full, a full spring salmon and then a half of a whale and a full whale and the wealth kept increasing so that they became more aware of their responsibilities to take care of people in the accumulation of that wealth. That is the space where I believe we are is in the moment of self critical self-reflection, reflecting upon our shared journey opportunities to change our behavior, to heed the warnings of the global climate crisis. Otherwise, we will face peril. I don't want to end on a, a negative note. I, I share this image of Landside Lady. Landside Lady is a crest of the Skidans Ravens. And uh, we know that it represents the irresistible power of the chief. And in potlatch, we wear two lines down our face as shown in this image, and it represents the trees coming down the hillside. And that was all that I found in the written record about landslide and all that I learned from my ancestors. And so I reflected on what is it to be an irresistible chief and what 
How is that tied to a landslide? And the original source of Indigenous laws is, of course, the land itself and the phenomenon of a landslide. A landslide happens when the world is out of balance and it comes down and it cleanses all of the trees and the soil and it uproots everything, but it allows for new growth. And the, new, the landslide believes in the Earth's ability to regrow, much like an irresistible chief or a powerful chief believes in their clan members. They uphold them instead of bringing them down. They support them. They encourage them, and they feed them and support them. And so Landslide Lady is about belief in humanity, believing in our ability to recover despite what we've gone through, to repair our relationship with each other, to repair our relationship um, caused, our fractured relationship caused by Terra Nullius and the Doctrine of Discovery. We learn from these oral narratives and the supernatural beings that like with the principles in restorative justice, we all need to understand that people, relationships, the land, and the sea have been violated. Indigenous peoples and our territories have been more violated than, than the rest of the land. We've all received warnings to requiring change. And so we need to turn back to the land and sea. We need to turn back to Landslide Lady, to Butterfly Woman, to Creek Woman, to Low Tide Woman, to all of the supernatural beings, and find out what their messages are so that we can find our path forward. We also need to persevere to find ways to convey our stories and our truths. Sanang Awas, sitting high, is not about someone sitting higher than others. Sanang Awas is the Haida name that, that was given to Iona Campanolo, but rather it is meant to represent someone who helps people, someone who feeds into the community, someone who wants to make the world a better place. And I acknowledge that all of us are here today because we desire that change. We have a relationship in that we've shared words. I've shared words with you, and hopefully you'll share words with me that will bind us together in a, in a commitment to make the world a better place, to find a way to restore the environment, and in doing so, restore our relationships and, and heal ourselves and heal our relationship with each other. And in an unexpected way, this Haida person finished on lawyer's time, ahead of time, <laughs> leaving more space for a discussion and a dialogue. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to call upon Councillor Doug Hillian, Board of, Board of Directors of the Community Justice Centre, to host the uh, question and answer session. So where, oh, there he is. He's sneaking out from stage left. <laughs> Thanks for, can everyone hear me? Perhaps that's better. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Bruce, and uh, to our speaker. And just before um, we start the next part of the program, um, I'm sure you'll permit me a, a small indulgence. Um, I wonder how many people here tonight, the last time you were in this theater was in the early spring 
of 2020 to hear Dr. Murray Sinclair at the last Campanola lecture. It, um, it just occurred to me um, earlier on that, uh, that that might be the case, and um, it seems very fitting to me that uh, we're here tonight hearing this message of restoration and healing as we emerge from a pandemic that uh, has created strains in relationships, in community, in the fabric of our community, and uh, how good it is to be together in this venue tonight at this time. So thank you to all of you for being here and participating in this event. I would like to uh, thank Terry Lynn Williams Davidson for her remarks this evening. They're challenging, insightful, and informative, and have significantly added to the remarkable legacy of the Campanola Lectures. Ms. Williams Davidson has graciously allowed time for audience questions on the subject of her talk this evening, and I will be your MC, which is a privilege and a pleasure. Because of the wide range of issues that flow out of her lecture, there is considerable scope for questions. When we call for questions, please come to one of the two mics set up near the front. and wait for your turn to pose your short question. This will ensure that all may hear the question so it is recorded as part of the video of this event. And um, those of you who uh, were at uh, Dr. Sinclair's presentation may know that it, uh, in fact, has been on the local cable station. So please tell your friends that uh, there will be hundreds of opportunities to see this uh, presentation on that station if they haven't had the opportunity to be here tonight. Regarding our question period, your patience is appreciated, and this procedure will ensure that we all enjoy and learn from this conversation. So, I will invite anyone who would like to pose a question to our speaker to come forward. Oh. Okay. And I'll, I'll just get out of the way here so that our speaker can have uh, this podium. And I'll just ask that uh, you identify yourself and then uh, pose your question, please. Amadon? Maybe you could just say that again. The mic took a while to connect. Sorry. Stephen Ferrer Amadon from Comox. My question is, you spoke about uh, the lack of indigenous law being incorporated in our society, if I understood your statement. And I'm wondering wh what you would say to whether that is something that is, can be changed um, through the actions of the settler community, which the original actions have not been very successful in many ways for the indigenous people. Uh, or is that something that uh, the indigenous people um, uh, need to do? Uh, and how, how can you see that being done for, for the future? Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. I can only draw upon the, uh, the experience that the Haida have gone through. Uh, we have been successful in incorporating fundamental laws into collaborative management with the Government of Canada and the Government of British Columbia. And they are actually set out in the management plans that will guide the management of the Guayanas area or the other areas in Haida Gwaii. But that was a long battle that took a long time. Uh, 30 years after the area was protected, we finally had a management plan that actually had the laws contained in it. There are places, other places like that where laws, there are starting to be more areas like that where they are written into management plans. Um, 
So I have hope that they're that that they will make their way into land into management of land and sea. There is a no, now a growing area of Indigenous laws. The University of Victoria has you can get a degree in both Indigenous law and Canadian law. That so we'll be creating lawyers who will understand what are Indigenous laws because you have to recognize them first before you can implement them and be guided by them. As for your second question about what settlers can do, it is certainly something that Indigenous peoples must do to properly articulate them and implement them. But we do need the support of others to do that because unfortunately governments are often reluctant to recognize Indigenous laws because it could mean in their minds give it, losing some of their jurisdiction and changing uh, the legal systems in Canada. We believe that there is, that we have many different jurisdictions that can live together and, and that our task is to find ways for those laws to live together. In Haida Gwaii, we've had a long history of working with the settler community who really have stood behind the Haida Nation and that has led to the changes that we've been able to see on Haida Gwaii. So while we only have 0.1% of the islands of Haida Gwaii in reserve status, 75% of the land is protected and under collaborative management. We still don't have a treaty, we still haven't completed our title case, but on the land itself, um, changes are happening, although it isn't yet reflected in law and it hasn't come out of court decisions yet. So that's a long-winded answer, and I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you Stephen. Uh, microphone over here. Hi, I'm David Stapley. I live in Royston. Uh, you may have answered this question in your last uh, answer, but I just wonder if you could comment on Indigenous protected areas which are proposed in a number of places in the province and whether you see this as uh, an opportunity for implementing Indigenous law. Thank you. Yes, that's a great question and yes, those are definitely areas that could incorporate and will incorporate Indigenous laws. Uh, again, as an example, in Haida Gwaii, we, we protected those areas uh, designated areas, 20 areas as protected many decades ago and only now have BC and Canada recognized those as, as protected and we're using our own laws to guide the management. Indigenous protected areas are also doing the same and are, that is an ideal vehicle for Indigenous laws to be expressed. Now, please don't be shy. Um, come up and ask a question, because if you don't, I'm going to. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Carrie McIntyre, and I live uh, in the regional district here. Um, thank you for your words this evening. Um, my question is about DRIPA, and I wonder if you might have some words of wisdom for local governments on how they're going to localize DRIPA, how they're going to recognize uh, and implement DRIPA at a community at a local level. Thank you. That's a tough question that I don't know that I have the answer to. I, I could maybe just set the context and say that until now, it has only been corporate or development interests that have influenced government decisions and not Indigenous people's interests and laws. So DRIPA is an opportunity to allow for greater voices to inform whether developments should proceed and if they proceed, how they might proceed. So the outcome of the Haida case was that, even aside from DRIPA, that accommodation is required, not just consultation. In my view, accommodation is, is protecting 75% of the territory and new rules of ecosystem-based management like in Haida Gwaii, that was the direct outcome of the Haida Nation case. So it is, it is a big decision, it is a, it is a big change, uh, and it doesn't mean no development, but it means different development. Thank you. And, uh, perhaps I'll just uh, 
to share, in case anyone's not aware, DRIPA is the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, which has been passed by the British Columbia government. And local government uh, leaders, a number of whom are here tonight, um, have had the opportunity to uh, take, take part in workshops with Indigenous leaders, experts um, who uh, are helping us to understand. And that question, in fact, comes up um, virtually every time we're involved in a presentation of that nature. This microphone, please. Hi, um, my name is Hannah and I live here in the Comox Valley. Uh, my question is about being a female artist and um, seeing your grandfather being a sculptor in the Haida Nation. I'm just wondering, what's your experience as a female Haida artist? And if that is a novelty in your culture or if that's an emerging art and then what's your experience as a female artist coming out of the Haida Nation into the greater world? Hmm. Those are great questions. <laughs> um, female artists are not unique in Haida culture. Uh, many were weavers. Robert's grandmother was a beautiful weaver of spruce root baskets and his aunties and his cousins um, less common are artists who, female artists who create form line art, although there are more art, female artists doing that art form as well, like Robert's art form. Um, mostly the weavers are women and not men. And I hate to make generalizations, but generally, um, Generally, women are very artistic and are an important part of the community. Um, I don't know that we would draw lines and say that a woman can't do art or a man can't weave. In fact, I know we wouldn't say that. So I don't know that I've ever questioned whether I can do art or not. Honestly, I don't think of myself as an artist, uh, mostly because I'm married to Robert Davidson, who's an incredible, prolific artist. Um, but, and so my art, I feel, is telling stories. And we all, whether we're male or female, have, can tell stories through whatever the medium is, like the images. Um, so the, the, the whole body of work in the exhibit is a desire not only to share these stories with the next generation who have had a small interruption in the sharing of that knowledge with this world that we live in, with Disney princesses and everything like that. Um, so that was my original desire to create this work was for young people, but also I realized that these these supernatural beings and the art have, have messages for the rest of the world that should be shared as well. And so whether the world was ready or not, I shared them. Uh, and I didn't question my position to do that or not. I hope that other artists, other people who are thinking of this kind of art form would also be encouraged to do so as well. I'm going to ask a follow-up while someone else uh, takes the uh, time to come up to the microphone. Um, I'm just wondering where you draw your uh, inspiration for the uh, depictions of the women in, uh, in the pieces that we saw tonight. Um, I'm wondering if it was only me that thought they bore a striking resemblance to yourself, if there's an element of self-portrait. Uh, um, <laughs> Perhaps I'm showing my, my ignorance here of, of, of art, but uh, I'm curious to know that. Uh, the inspiration for the pieces came from the teachings that our mother passed on to us and our grandmother, but also from doing a very meticulous read of the ethnographic record about what it said about each of the supernatural beings, and then really looking to the, the natural world around me to see what those lessons are. And so each piece is a true representation of what was either in the ethnographic record or what was passed to me by my parents or grandparents or people in the community. Um, the whole piece of the work, the whole body of work is 
like a dance performance, like putting on a shark blanket and becoming the shark. Each piece was an opportunity to do that, to perform and to become Swainson's Thrush Woman or Octopus Woman, and in that process, learn more about the messages that Octopus Woman or Swainson's Thrush Woman had to share with us so that then I could complete the writing of the book about the lessons that came from the act of becoming those beings. So it wasn't just um, a project of vanity to put on wigs or dresses or all of that, but really it was really trying, trying to help people visualize these beings and instead of only the powerful abstract art images that Robert and other artists create, but rather trying to visualize what they might have looked like in the stories that our ancestors told us about them. Thank you. Thank you. They're, they're all very striking and spellbinding. I, I think everyone here was, was, uh, was grabbed and held during uh, each of the presentations. Thank you. Microphone over here, please. Uh, Gayla Kesla, Nukuam Grant, thank you for being here. Um, my question is, is with regard to um, recognizing Aboriginal title with uh, federal Canada, with uh, colonial Canada, and how it's um, challenged or problematized by the relationship between the hereditary law and the Indian Act. Right. Thank you. That is a massive question that I <laughs> don't know the answer to. Again, I, I can really only draw upon uh, my own experience in the Haida Nation. We, the Council of the Haida Nation is a new entity. It is a new creation that draws and integrates hereditary leadership, elected leadership, uh, female matriarchs, and the people. And that was our way of ensuring that we would not be fractured by the forces of colonization, but that we'd be, we would be a strong governing body that would be rooted in, in traditional governance, but yet fulfill the needs to negotiate with the provincial and federal governments. And so our approach, we've been able to do the advanced work of reconciliation within our nation to ensure that all interests are reflected. I can see in other places that it is a challenge where those interests diverge. Um, that work of building consensus within the nation is hard, hard work. It took decades before our constitution was finalized because of those pulls of seeing how we could work together to see how this new governance model would work for us as a nation. But we knew it was necessary because uh, the Indian Act system wasn't the way that we saw forward, but we needed someone who would, a body that would represent all the interests, those who had status and those who did not have status, and all the different governing bodies, for them to have a voice to ensure that title would be recognized on Haida Gwaii. Um, I think it's really a question for each nation to work through how they can resolve those pulls within the nation to try to build consensus so that we um, can come forward with strength. Thank you. Uh, someone else, uh, the next microphone, please. Good evening. It's Penny Hacking in Courtney. This question comes with deep respect and deeper ignorance. Indigenous law, is it understood in the same way in each Aboriginal nation? And is it, is Indigenous law recognized beyond the boundaries of colonized definition of Canada? Right, so there are certain fundamental laws that are likely common to all Indigenous peoples. Um, likely, things like respect, what I called yakudang in the Haida language, or the need for re recognizing interconnectedness, um, reciprocity. Those kinds of laws are, are more than likely fun common to all indigenous peoples. Um, how they are expressed and the, the nuances of the meaning will be different among each indigenous nation. 
So, um, I've forgotten the second part of your question. I was just wondering if Indigenous law would be understood beyond the borders of Canada. Right. Because I, I, Indigenous nations don't conform to our boundaries. Right. Um, yes, they are. For example, just as an aside, the Haida Nation, our territory goes into Alaska, Southeast Alaska. So our laws span boundaries. There are many nations that span um, colonial, national, international boundaries. But as well, there is growing scholars and a growing number of scholars who are looking at indigenous laws all over the world. Um, every indigenous peoples experience this idea and this view that we were literally, they thought we were too primitive and too stupid to have laws, to govern ourselves, to take care of our territories, and therefore the land was free for the taking. And that message just kept getting heaped on and over and over so that these indigenous laws were suppressed. And so now we're like looking, it's like looking at a robe in a museum that is starting to fray. That it, it is an experience of reweaving things together to find those indigenous laws to understand them, which is what Octopus Woman, my depiction of Octopus Woman was about because indigenous peoples ourselves are starting to recognize what our laws are and to express them and to realize that certain dances mean this and certain protocols mean that. And actually, it's this, this law that we need to come to bear on our daily lives. There are, of course, knowledge holders who have always known that, um, but their expressing of it has also been suppressed. And so that is why there is this big movement to recognize Indigenous laws, to gain certification in it, because it has been suppressed for so long. So we're all learning as well. Uh, the Haida Nation are learning what are Haida laws. We've known the fundamental ones, but actually creating and expressing a legal system is a big piece of work that many scholars are working to achieve. So um, those laws, we have not found their way into courts yet. Often indigenous litigants like the, um, the LNG litigants and the Wet'suwet'en, they expressed indigenous laws, but they didn't, weren't expressed in decisions from the court. So we have a long way to go with the court understanding indigenous laws as well so that we can understand those laws and fit them, see where they sit with the common law system. Thank you very much. I'm wondering if I can just follow that up. Um, many Wait of a us. Wait a minute. Are you a lawyer? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, I, I did work in the court system, but a much lower rung than uh, than being a lawyer. Um, I'm wondering. Uh, many of us uh, see the court system as something that uh, is fairly fixed and rigid, um, difficult to change, and yet at the same time. Um, our, our superior courts create fundamental change that impacts our lives in a, in, a, in a significant way. So I'm just wondering how you have found actually presenting to the court to what extent you've been able to bring the supernatural element um, of Indigenous law and history into your presentation and how it's been received by the individual justices that you've argued in front of. That, yeah, that's a great question too. Um, as I've said, this, the courts have not yet recognized Indigenous laws. When I told the Supreme Court of Canada about Cedar Sister, uh, Madam Justice McLaughlin was the Chief Justice then and she listened to my submissions. The other judges didn't want to hear it and actually whispered to her, do we really have to listen to this? So they don't understand the significance of it and even though they heard it, you didn't read about Cedar Sister in the decision, in the written reasons of the Supreme Court of Canada in the Haida Nation case. You don't hear about the indigenous laws that uh, we told the court about in the Ambridge Northern Gateway Pipeline Challenge where we presented a picture of Robert's 
art and his illustration of a raven traveling story and the need to um, have more balance in our lives, those kinds of things don't end up in the decisions. Despite that, um, I still think there is an opportunity because Aboriginal law is really empty and is to be defined by each nation's laws. And some of the things they have got right, um, Aboriginal title has an inherent limit, which means that we can't use the lands in a way that prevents future generations from using those lands in the same way. That is really a sustainability limit. The next step is to apply that sustainability limit, not just to Indigenous title lands, but to all lands. Um, another thing that is good in principle is this idea that conservation should come first in management of fish. Of course, that priority isn't always respected, but there is an opportunity to try to change the law for the better for all of us, and Indigenous laws provides that opportunity. Thank you. Another question over here. Hi. Um, having trouble with the words in my head. I don't know how they're going to come out. Can you just share your name first, please? Yes, I'm Laura. I live in Courtney. Um, I'm really inspired by the things I see and hear and feel about Indigenous law and about the land and waters being part of everything. And when I think about um, uh, and feel my tendency towards you know, being an ally in honouring Indigenous sovereignty, I picture that that is the type of thing that will be leading that movement. And, and I'm so excited and honoured to get to be part of seeing that change and become part of my life more. I get really overwhelmed and confused when um, a, a nation, an Indigenous nation, whether it be through elected council in the cases I'm thinking of, um, are kind of just saying, go away, we just want to get what we can from the resources. And I understand that they're in a bind and needing the little bits that come their way from the government that's put them in that position. But in the meantime, where conservation is the last thing, I, I don't know how to honor, if honoring indigenous sovereignty is to honor whatever any elected council of any nation wants to decide, even if it seems to be against what I'm hearing about Indigenous law. Just looking for perspectives on that. Yeah, so our, my perspective and the perspective of a true sovereignist is that every nation determines their course. And so I wouldn't get involved in another nation's decision to do something that was contrary to my values because it's their values and their journey and their lesson. And, but I do hear what you're saying. And at the same time, I have to, we have to recognize every single indigenous family has been impacted by colonization with people who have addictions, who live very poorly and I think it, I, I could not be uh, in government because it is such a hard job uh, facing seeing the high suicide rates and the fact that we're confined to reserves without any economic income any way to keep our families fed any way to like we just don't have what other people have and so at some point they're the ones who are balancing the best needs of the community and the land around them. And it's in some ways, it's a little unfair to say that someone can't do something when yet everything has been taken around the community. So it, it is really a hard question. And I would, my heart would um, hurt for the damage to the land, but I really wouldn't intercede and would leave it for that community to work through that hard job of what is the best balance. I'd like to follow up? Yes, please. Um, I like what you were saying about the government uh, leaving, leaving nations in those kind of positions. Um, what I really want to see is our government 
provide resources to allow different types of decisions. But, and I, I also hear what you're saying. I, I, don't, I don't honor sovereignty in my own people. <laughs> like, I don't like what they're doing and I'm saying, hey, don't do that. So when I get if there's like a nation here and a nation here and everyone makes their own decisions, it's up to them. But what about when decisions of some are gonna kill everybody because the air and the water in one place transfers to another? Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Well, I, I don't, again, I don't know that I can answer that question more than what I've said, and, but I do hear you and thank you. Thanks, and we have someone coming to this microphone. Can you speak up a bit, Betty, and perhaps um, keep your yeah. mask on? To Is that keep, better? Can you keep your mask yeah. on? Thanks. Gayla Kessler, my name's Betty. I've been struggling this year with the word reconciliation. I'm of a settler background, so I go to the Oxford Dictionary as one source. And I got comfort in the idea that reconciliation is a word that allows us to live with differences and accept multiplicities of points of view. And for me, that somehow fits into the ideal of Canadian multiculturalism. And then I come to trying to understand reconciliation with Indigenous people. And you clarified tonight Aboriginal law, Indigenous law, and settler law, and I, I really, that helped me. I think I'm still confused about unceded territory. And I'm still confused about how Indigenous peoples might handle territorial differences among themselves. So as a person who is a speaker for your, your nation, uh, that has quite a reputation uh, for self-assertion, both past and present, which I'm um, very respectful of, how, how, how do we handle the edges of these differences? I've heard you talk about building, and I understand education, I understand restoration, but when we, how do we avoid violence? Thank you. Boy, you're really a tough crowd, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes when I speak about reconciliation, I show an image that uh, Uli Stelzer took of the potlatch that Gala gave and, and draw upon what Robert has shared with me about what happens before a potlatch. Um, if you read the ethnographic record, you might hear about these rivaling potlatches trying to outdo each other and bigger, 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 bigger. But actually, there is work that must be done in advance to ensure that people show up at the potlatch and that the business is conducted properly. And th that is what I see as reconciliation, is doing the work of building consensus. So Robert, in, in the many potlatches that he's hosted, was taught and coached by his grandmother to uh, build alliances leading up to the potlatch. An elder has shared with us a word that describes your conduct leading up to a potlatch in that you are continually working to build alliances so that the business can be done. So the work, the disputes between clans, that must be the advanced reconciliation. The, the clans must be engaging in that advanced reconciliation, ideally before a potlatch. Uh, a, couple, a few years ago, the Haida had a member of Darren Swanson of the Yakutlanas had a potlatch, and his clan ousted a chief who had signed an agreement with the for with Enbridge for the Northern Gateway Pipeline project, and it was not uh, the wishes of the clan. So that potlatch was a way for the community to come together and, and express the wishes of the people and how a chief conducts themselves. There was a lot of advanced reconciliation that had to be done, and that also occurred in the potlatch, but it did not get violent. Um, I don't know if you're speaking about that kind of working together of clans, uh, but it is like the Haida word for law, it is about speaking 
it re it's recognizing that, like the lessons from Swainson's thrush, that when we say something, it has an income and has an impact in the world. And so we need to be careful with our word and express it in a way that helps to build alliances rather than pulling ourselves apart. And that often means finding commonalities, even amongst interests that are so wildly different you would never think they would be together, but yet they find a commonality and are able to forge forward. That seems like it might be a fitting point to end, um, as no one else is coming to the mic. And um, uh, your acknowledgement of it being a tough audience, um, of course, it's it's a tough subject. There's lots yes. of thorny questions to answer, but I think also... I do also, appreciate the questions. <laughs> well, I hope you also appreciate that a lot of us haven't been out very much lately. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we're going to, uh, to let you uh, sit down and um, with great appreciation for your thoughtfulness and your clarity in responding to all the questions. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, what I would like to do now is um, call upon um, our Community Justice Center Administrator, Mr. Bruce Curtis, uh, who is going to wrap up the evening and thank our speaker. And I would just ask you to join me in uh, thanking and acknowledging Bruce for the amazing work he's done through this lecture and all the other ones that brings such a richness to our community. Thank you, Bruce. This brings to a close the 10th Annual Campanola Lecture in Restorative Justice. And I thank you for joining us and for marking this milestone. I also extend my incredibly sincere appreciation to Gita Ausleier, Terry Lynn Williams Davidson, for the lecture, together with the other events marking the 10th anniversary, as well as the very many teachings and presentations she has already and will continue to share with students in the Comox Valley Schools. This is part of our collective journey to reconciliation with First Nations, and so we express the wish. May we each grow into and become Mikalakswala, masters of what has been dreamed of. As has now become traditional for these lectures, I'm prepared to release the name of the 11th Campanola lecturer, and it is a name you will immediately recognize, Dr. Cindy Blackstock. She is Professor of Social Work at McGill University in Montreal and Executive Director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. Blackstock is an influential voice within the Indigenous social work and child's rights communities. She's a member of the Gisan First Nation. Blackstock has spoken out about systemic inequalities in public services experienced by First Nation children, youth, and families. Her Canadian Human Rights Commission complaint filed in 2004 led to the landmark decision which ruled that the federal government's long-standing underfunding of child and, and family services on First Nations reserves and failure to ensure First Nations children can access government services on the same basis as other children discriminates against the 163,000 First Nations children on the grounds of race and national and ethnic origin. She is called Canada's relentless moral force. So you don't want to counter her. For First Nations equality and a mountain of power. Perhaps her own little line slide lady. For her continuing work on ending the discrimination against First Nations children and families. The 11th Campanola Lecture will be delivered sometime in the late winter spring of 2022. So just, you know, four or five months from now. Watch for an announcement of it, which is sure to become a fascinating evening. Once again, thank you for joining us this evening and have a safe trip home. I've also uh, been permitted to let you know that uh, 
Terry Lynn will be available in the lobby if you wanted to have a, a few personal chats with her, with your masks on, of course, and socially distanced. But uh, the, she has been incredibly generous with her time. She arrived here on Tuesday, and she's not leaving until Sunday. Uh, she has an opening uh, at the gallery on Friday via online um, broadcast and a concert here on Saturday night with her band uh, featuring songs that she wrote and composed to accompany some of the images which you saw here and some other images that you'll see on Saturday night. Tickets are still available in the, off in the ticket office. So I thank you again for this uh, attendance this evening. And I would just remind our speaker that it was only a half tough audience. <laughs> until we can figure out how to get the other half of the audience, which is online, to be able to phone in their questions, she'll just have to come back and do a full tough audience. Thank you very much.